Hi, and welcome back to Overheard Orlando podcast. This is Stephen, as per usual, uh, here for season two or chapter two or whatever you want to call it. Overheard Orlando is back. Coming in on the heels of the year that changed everything, 2021 has been, at least for me, an absolute godsend. And I can't wait to share with you all of the new things in my life and the personal growth. And I can't wait to hear from you as well. It has been a while and I'm happy to be back. But that is not why we're here today. Today, we'll be speaking with Tom Sadler, who is one of the most prolific and most talented artists here in Orlando. I can only describe him as an American impressionist whose level of mastery goes beyond even the uncommon. While this episode centers heavily around painting, any individual who dabbles in creativity in pretty much any form will find the wisdom within his words. So, without further ado, let's get into it. All right. Well, hello there, Tom, and thank you so much for being on. Well, thank you. I appreciate this. Stephen, good to be here. You utilize a type of uh, painting technique known as plain air painting. Can you tell me a little bit about it and what your take on it is? Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, Plain air actually means painting in the open air. So it's nothing new. Obviously, the Impressionist were especially known for going out in the open air rather than just working in their studio. And it brought a new kind of a light, all about the light and broken color to their work, a more spontaneous look. And that's usually associated with plein air painting. Uh, You have about an hour and a half to complete a painting before the sun really changes. I mean, I could get technical and say on a gray day, you have several hours to work, working from life. Even though it has become kind of a go-to means of working, it also just can complement your studio work. In fact, that's probably what's thought of as the way it originated, is that painters would go out, paint in the open field, and maybe just do a cloud study or perhaps, you know, a portion of a lake and then go back to their studio and it would help them in their studio piece, which would be a larger, more uh, refined piece that they would work on in layers. And the plein air work was just to complement or uh, something they could refer to. It was their reference, you know, for working on a studio piece. So, I've done both. I, I've used it as my reference for a studio piece, but I've also worked on a large painting, taken it to the location, worked some plein air back in the studio, worked some in the studio. So it's a bit of back and forth. Um, working from nature is always a plus. So In previous conversations I've had with you, as well as um, notated on your site, it seems like you have a certain draw to water and light in particular. So what would you say is the significant of these two elements on a personal level and in regards to your work? Well, yeah, that's interesting. I am drawn to water. I guess my wife and I both seem to incorporate water as, you know, looking through my portfolio, I realized without even being that aware of it, that most of my paintings are include rivers or lakes or the ocean, or it could be, you know, um, a stream. But I guess, and the light, sometimes I say that the subject of my work is actually the light, the way the light is hitting a subject, because to me that's, obviously we don't see anything without light. So light plays a big part in uh, creating a piece of art for me. I like to think that a painting comes to life when you feel like light almost emanates from the painting. So in a way, it's uh, bringing life to the painting to have a sense of light. 
In regards to plein air, you mentioned that it was a technique utilized by the Impressionists in particular. Uh, what is it that speaks to you about Impressionism? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I love the Impressionists. Uh, very colorful. Um, been to Monet's Garden and uh, a city called Pontois. And... Just the application of paint there, they were not afraid to have it look a little more sketchy. In fact, some of their first works, I don't even know if they considered them finished pieces, but as time went on, they were considered uh, finished works in themselves, even though they were done, you know, right outdoors using nature as your studio. Uh, so it was Really neat experience to go, say, for instance, to where Van Gogh lived, and I saw his grave, and it was at auvers sur and they would have the cathedral and a poster of his painting of the cathedral outside of it, so you could see exactly where he was standing when he painted, you know, this particular church or whatever it might be. Uh, there were different scenes all around the city that were like that. So I'm just drawn to their use of their handling of the paint, uh, juicier, uh, more substantial paint. Um, they usually worked in more than one sitting, uh, going Monet, for instance, in his Water Lilies or, or the Haystack series. He'd go back and just there again, it was about the light, the way the objects receive the light and... Um, just trying with each attempt to not just observe light and dark, but color patches, like a spot of color. And if you unite enough matching or varied spots of color, then eventually you're going to have a something that comes to life and looks uh, believable and three-dimensional. Cool. I mean, so when you when you talk about objects hitting the light and stuff, it really makes me feel like you're capturing a moment in time because we we use the sun to tell time. You know, it, it tells the different hours of the day and things like that. So it kind of feels like you're capturing a true moment in time. And and with the way that, that the sun rises and sets from day to day, it's going to be a little different. So you really are kind of capturing a pretty unique moment uh, when you paint something like that with such a uh, emphasis on light. And I think that's really cool. Obviously, barring our artificial light, which can stay, you know, the same indefinitely. Um, right. Yeah. Yep. In regards to some of the pieces that would have been considered incomplete, which are now considered complete, obviously, because it's been many years since the original artist's passing. Mm -hmm. um, how do you know when a piece is complete? I feel like that could be um, pretty relevant for any form of art, really. Like, how do you know when a piece of writing's done? How do you know when a song is done? How do you know when a, a piece of your art is done? Yes, right. Yeah, the whole idea of Impressionism, there was one painting that they, it was like his impression of the sun setting over the scene, and it, he called Impression of the sun, Sunset, and so the term Impressionism stuck. But... Uh, just as far as finish, yeah, I always think of it as degrees of finish that each painting could possibly go through. Um, you're right in that the time of day, if you have a plein air painting painted in the morning, it will draw on the fact that you have that morning light, which is more specific to a slanting, you know, rays of light coming across uh, so that shadows are longer. But in regards to finish, it, I would say that you can take a quarter of a painting, say divide your painting into quarters and just look at each quarter in a separate sense and see if it looks kind of complete or if there's any, a lot of times it's just solving a problem. Is there a problem area that bothers you? If not, then perhaps it has finished for that stage or maybe it's a finished painting. Uh, Pizarro was known to have said, that he knew a painting was finished when he had no more gifts to give it. So I look at it that way, too, as sometimes in working over a painting, you're trying to give it any gift that you could possibly give it. And 
when you run out of gifts, then you know that's probably has done for you what you set out to do. So I usually think that when a painting, when I don't want it to leave my studio, when I'm kind of uh, have become a bit captivated by it and I don't want it to go, then that's when I know it's ready for the gallery or ready to be shown. What would you say is the job or the, the purpose of an artist? Yeah, I had an old mentor, uh, Jack Dempsey, not the boxer, but a uh, great painter out of uh, Huntsville, Alabama. But he, he emphasized that our job as an artist is to provide and withhold information. Uh, so on a two-dimensional surface, you are bringing that to life and, and trying to, if you're working in a sense of realism, you're trying to give it a three-dimensional look. So he would say that in providing and withholding information, the far greater skill is what you withhold. So that was always an important lesson, and I still refer to that phrase because of its significance to an artist because there's so much information out there. If you had 10 or 20 artists painting the same scene, they're all going to select different things to emphasize uh, different things to bring out, different things to withhold. Uh, it's the novice that usually tries to present it maybe more like a photo where disregarding edges, going hard edge everywhere, and not giving and taking a bit, uh, leaving something softer, losing edges here and there to uh, give your painting even more emphasis uh, you know, one of the things that has always drawn me to creativity as a whole, again, across varying types of art forms, is that it's kind of like you're creating your own version of reality. In some cases, a completely different reality. In some cases, a little more similar. It's kind of like uh, when I when I first met you, I had let I had told you I always thought impressionism was called impressionism because of it, the impression it leaves with you. Like to me, it looks like. <clears throat> a setting, a, sim a familiar setting, but in a dream or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's interesting too. Sometimes I tell painters, like when you go out to a scene and you, the sun is blazing and you're, you're really impressed by this, what you think is going to make a great painting. Uh, it's your first impression. You look up, you, you have a great first impression of the scene. Well, what starts to happen as you paint is that you start looking, say, for instance, in the shadows where it's dark and your pupils do what they do and compensate for that so they open up and open up and before you know it, your darks are not as dark as they first seemed. So you're painting your shadows too light and the opposite happens in light areas. You paint your lights too dark. So you have to train yourself to look away from the scene and look back at it and try to get that first impression that first struck you uh, as something you were drawn to that you liked enough to want to paint it. So that's an important point is your impression. You're right. Excellent. Um, now, you're not only a painter. You're also a teacher as well, correct? Right. I, you know, have taught some artists for, oh, maybe 30 years or so. Um, I guess I got inspired by my teacher the, who meant so much to me. And I just felt, wow, if I could pass this on and maybe add a little more, then uh, it would be really beneficial. Uh, teaching a student right now who's 22 and doing really well. And I wish I'd had, you know, the teacher that I had, I wish I'd had him 10 years before I did because it would have meant a lot. Uh, but you do what you do. You buy art books, you study, and you never quit learning, you know. So that's the great thing about painting is, as, as my mentor also said, painting will use you up. You can spend your whole lifetime and never know all there is to know about, especially oil painting. So that brings me to a, a really interesting question because... For me, my talents lie more with words, and um, I can't draw a picture. Like, I like I'm 
I'm really bad. Like I, I'm, I'm below <laughs> average bad at drawing and painting and things like that. Um, I do it maybe for fun sometimes, but it's right. it's really not even anything I would I would show anyone that I didn't know. Right. But um, what what that brings into mind is innate talent versus acquired technique. Like, can anybody kind of gain a mastery over painting? How important is talent versus just desire? Yes, there's the old line that everybody says, you know, I can't even draw a straight line. Well, maybe you don't need to draw straight lines. And to me, more than talent, I guess it's your passion for it. Um, I feel like if you've been drawn to it enough to want to draw or paint, then you're going to be pushing yourself a bit to try to develop a little bit of skill with it. And people can be taught, uh, you can simplify it to measuring, looking for negative shapes rather than the positive shape. There are tricks of your mind using more your right brain than your left brain to, um, uh, it's actually helping you see better is really what it boils down to. It's not so much that people cannot draw, it's that they cannot see. They're not seeing like an artist wood or um, what an artist can uh, bring to the table with what they see. So it has to do with edges, has to do with light and shadow. Um, but if you're interested enough in learning more about those, uh, I think it's a drive that you have that whether you learn from a workshop or a particular teacher or whether you learn by trial and error uh, or reading you know, books on drawing, I think there are ways to develop your drawing and painting skills, even if you are not known or do not have that in your uh, wheel box. Honestly, I've asked that question before to, to artists, maybe not necessarily recorded questions, but I've, I've, it's always been a question I've had just because of how little natural talent I have for it. But um, that's actually probably one of the coolest answers I've ever gotten with the um, how to look at things like an artist because I definitely, if I'm painting, if I want to draw an apple, I'm going to draw the outline of the apple and I'm not going to really think about the negative space or the, the drawing the space around it or anything like that. Uh -huh. So that was really cool. So in regards to teaching and, you know, you had mentioned you had a teacher that was pretty impactful on your craft. And I'm sure that you have students who probably are very thankful for all the things you showed them. What would you say to a novice or a struggling artist who might be trying to attain like your level of success or your skill level and is maybe either just starting out or is somewhere in the middle? Yeah, I would just say always try to do your best painting, your best drawing. Um, you're your own worst critic or maybe best critic, however you want to look at it. Um, I think it helps to look at master works, um, look at artist work that you admire, and uh, there may be, you know, everything we do is memory to some degree. There used to be the old saying of Degas that he had the model on the second floor, but the students' drawing pads were on the first floor. So they had to go up, look at the model, and then go back down to the first floor to draw. So everything was memory. So actually, I look at it that way to some degree. You can never actually be looking at something and drawing it at the exact same time. So everything you're doing is memory to some degree. It's like they say, you have to put in your 10,000 hours, uh, try to do a lot of small paintings, um, work plain air, work uh, set up a still life, even though it may just be simple shapes. Uh, you're just learning to use paint. You're learning to draw. Uh, all shapes can be boiled down to like the square, the cube, and the, the sphere, the cone, and the cube. So you master those shapes, and when you start looking at trees or buildings or whatever it might be, all of those shapes help in your being able to see what's in front of you and to put it down three-dimensionally or 
what seems three-dimensionally on a two-dimensional surface. So one of the words that gets thrown around a lot when it comes to art is the word priceless. For example, if I'm on the market to buy a car, I can kind of look at what each part costs. I can look at what the labor, what the market is doing, all those kinds of things. And I can attach, if nothing else, a price range. Uh, Art is one of those things where both the artist and the person purchasing probably have a, a pretty different idea on what the value of any piece is. So when you finish a piece, how do you come up with a, a price and, and a dollar amount to attach to that. Right. And it has gotten easier over the years, I think, because you, you've at least established some something to base it on. I think it's hard for a starting artist sometimes to, to start out knowing how to price their work. Um, but yeah, even though it seems, you know, kind of an unusual way to go about it, a lot of artists go by the square inch. You know, it doesn't mean that, you know, you don't alter that a bit. For instance, in the past, say in the 90s, I was selling a 10 by 14 or 11 by 14 for, you know, a certain price and felt very good about it. And as the years go by, you just feel like that size will go up in value. In other words, you can't just keep charging what you got in the 90s. Even though, you know, there are times where like in 2008, when uh, we, none of us were doing that well, you kind of take it into account, but still try to keep your value up there to what it had been in the past. So each year you should increase your price a bit. uh, And that's only good for collectors. I mean, any collector that is, that has several of your pieces, um, it's only to their good that your work goes up in value. So they wouldn't want to come across a painting and then find that it goes for less now than what they bought it for 10 years ago, for instance. Do you ever take any kind of esoteric things into account when you're pricing, like your personal attachment to the painting? Have you ever had a painting that you liked so much mm. that you couldn't put it out there? Yeah, that is a good question. i I run across that every now and then. I had one teacher that said you should always, every year, your style is maybe going to change a bit. So, so keep at least one painting, you know, that shows a style you were working in that year. But yeah, I recently hesitated about giving a painting to a gallery because I, I was feeling like, you know, there's a certain degree of finish versus unfinished that it had that I, that I strive for at times and don't always accomplish. So I felt like I really, that one really worked for me. And um, I kind of hate to see it go. But then again, just like your children, you can't get so attached that you can't let them go on and (laughs) have their own life, I guess. I, I love the personification there. That was, that was fantastic. So uh, to wrap it up, I'm going to go ahead and um, ask you what I ask pretty much all of the guests that appear on this show. Um, What would you say is your personal philosophy, like your your overall outlook on life? Uh, Well, I'm known as a fairly positive person. I always look on the bright side of things. Um, My wife thinks that she looks more on the the realist side. being realistic or I'm idealistic or maybe, you know, uh, romanticize a bit about things. Um, so I don't know that I have an overall philosophy, just, um, I love nature and I love pristine, you know, areas of Florida and any area. I mean, we go to New Mexico and paint, we've gone to Italy and, my takeaways there are I love old things with character. And so as those disappear, you know, over time, uh, it's great to have captured, captured them in some way that will live on even if they disappear. So maybe that's a part of it. Uh, Capturing a part of Florida that changes and disappears too fast. All right. Well, Tom, thank you so much for allowing me to interview you. You are definitely one of the 
most prolific and talented artist I've ever had the pleasure to interview. So I, I really thank you so much for your time. Oh, well, thank you, Stephen. Really appreciate it. I was glad to do it. It's an honor. It was such an absolute honor to interview with Mr. Sadler here today. And honestly, so many parts of this interview are going to stick with me. But the, the one thing that really will stick with me is that whole artist eye thing. The looking at things like an artist, I think that speaks so much into perspective and, and things. And, and you can carry that into any type of creative field or life in general. Um, that part will really, really stick with me uh, the most, I think. All right, let's see if I still remember how to do this. You can follow me on Instagram at Overheard Orlando Podcast, or you can email me at Overheard Orlando Podcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. I can't wait to show you guys what I have in store for you next. So stay tuned, stay alive, and stay true.